now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the new minister to make her first order of business to scrap the proposed SEIU-backed home care agency. The cosy Liberal ties to the SEIU are apparent as the minister refused to budge. Indeed, she touted Washington State's model. Well, Speaker, that state's agency, also SEIU-backed, is rife with controversy. In fact, the headline from the Seattle Times editorial board read, and I quote, legislators don't cave in to home care union, reject bill that would increase cost. So, Mr. Speaker, is, the model we want, is this the model we want to follow, one that increases costs and harms patients? Wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, let me just congratulate the new here, Minister here. of Health yeah. and Long-Term yeah. Care. Mr. Speaker, you know, I, um, I really believe that we cannot, we can actually not overstate the importance of personal support workers in our society. Yeah. I, you know, these, these are people, largely women, Mr. Speaker, who look after the very most vulnerable in our society. So, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are looking for ways to support uh, this group of people who are so, so important. Um, I know that the, uh, the party opposite did not support the increased uh, wages that we put in place a couple of years ago, Mr. Speaker, directly to personal support workers. But, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to work with the people who are looking after our elderly, Mr. Speaker. The people who are looking after uh, people with disabilities, Mr. Yes, Speaker, sir. doing some of the very hardest work in our society. We're going to continue to look for ways to support them and professionalize their workplace. Both sides have had their opportunity, and both sides have indicated to me that they're going to pick up where they left off. So am I. Next people that decide they're going to chirp, we're going to go to warnings. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Patience Canada yesterday came out against the government's proposed agency. Quote, two-thirds of patients and caregivers surveyed, surveyed stated that they trust existing community care services yeah, yeah. that employ nurses, personal support workers, and other home care providers. Patients oppose the new proposed Ontario government agency. Quote, Patients Canada believes that there should be less bureaucracy and more choice when it comes to selecting home care providers. This is how they feel, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, why does the government refuse to put patients first? Well, Mr. Speaker, I would just say, I would say to the uh, to the member opposite. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Carry on. I, I would say to the uh, member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that uh, either he doesn't understand what it is that we are doing, Mr. Speaker, or he doesn't think that actually giving patients more choice is a good thing, because that's in fact what uh, what we're looking at. The other thing is, Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised that the member opposite would suggest that. Everything's just fine. We don't need to change a thing in terms of the way supports are delivered to people in communities. I bet the next question is going to be, Mr. Speaker, how do we put more money into the system? How do we provide better home care? Mr. Speaker, we are working with personal support workers. We are working with the people who are yes, on sir. the front line, who are dealing with uh, a workplace that can be improved, Mr. Speaker. We're going to do that. We're going to support them because that means Thank patients you. will yeah. get better service. You see it, please? You see it, please? Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. This SCIU backed home care agency makes no sense. For heaven's sake, Speaker, the VON is suing this government. Oh. Providers are against this. Patients are against this. Workers are against this. But SEIU is in favour of this. So, Mr. Speaker, who exactly is the government doing this for? 
Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yes, this is a, a new model. Uh, it is one that has uh, proved its worth. It is definitely putting uh, the patient at the centre of the care services. Here, here. We are going to be giving Ontarians more control and choice over how they receive their home care services. Continue. The member from Simcoe Grey is warned. The member from Elgin Middlesex London is warned. Wish I know who said it. Mr. Speaker, we know that there is a small group of patients with chronic long-term care needs, and they need to have that strong uh, relationship with their care provider. Continuity of care is particularly important for this group of patients, and this is exactly what we're working towards. Answer. We know that PSWs are an extremely important frontline care worker. We have been supporting them Thank you. on this side of the House. Thank you. Any question? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A little later today, uh, I'll be speaking at the Ontario Forest Industries Association. For years, they have been raising the same concerns, Speaker. For years, this government has ignored them. The forest industry generates over $15.5 billion of economic impact and provides jobs for over 172,000 hardworking men and women. We've already heard from the OFIA and its member companies that the governments continue to ignore the importance of the forestry sector. As Jamie Lim, their director, said, quote, Ontario is three times larger than Finland, but we harvest 80 percent less. That represents lost opportunity. Question. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals content on losing the opportunities our forestry sector offers? Well, Mr. Speaker, quite to the contrary. Um, we are very supportive of our forestry industry. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in my trips to, um, to the United States, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have made a very strong case and worked with the federal government to try to advance the issues around the softwood lumber arrangement, Mr. Speaker, because we know that um, Ontario has a very important role to play in that supply discussion in North America, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to come to uh, an agreement with the United States that actually is advantageous to, uh, to uh, our, or even fair, I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to the Canadian lumber industry, to the Ontario lumber industry. But, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to support our forestry industry. I know, Mr. Speaker, that it's a, if, it's a 15 plus billion dollar industry, Mr. Speaker, and there are 172,000 direct and indirect jobs. We understand that, which is exactly why we're supporting the forestry industry, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. Nowhere. Do we see more red tape than the government's overly restrictive Endangered Species Act? This isn't a new issue. In 2016, at the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association Annual Conference, Kenora Mayor and NOMA President Dave Canfield summarized it clearly, quote, the Endangered Species Act could kill us, period. The forestry sector is already abiding by the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. The duplication is not necessary. We must find a balance between environmental protection and economic sustainability. Mr. Speaker, is the government prepared to endanger thousands of northern forestry jobs just because it can't keep Question. its own laws straight? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Affairs. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank the member for the question and what uh, Jamie Lim would say if she were here and what she has probably expressed to the member is that we have just once again extended the exemption on the ESA for an additional two years. And what that means is, Speaker, on the point that's been made by the member in his question is that that will now be a seven-year total. I'm going to win. A member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order. You are warned. Finish. So, Speaker, what it means is that that will now be a seven year total exemption as we work through issues related to the ESA. 
By way of example, Speaker, when we hear this party stand up and criticize the supports that we've brought forward for the forestry sector, I would give one example that speaks volumes. In the early 90s, the NDP government downloaded the cost of maintaining forestry roads in the Thank province sir. of Ontario. For eight years, the PCs did nothing to reverse that decision. We have, just on the forestry roads program, provided about $800 million of support through only Thank one you. program for forestry companies. Thank you. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. Matt Wilkie, a forester at Weyerhaeuser in Kenora, told us that about a third of their company's wood supply in Kenora comes from a new caribou zone. The Caribou Protection Regulations Act will result in a 40 to 70 percent reduction in forestry activities, significantly reducing wood supply. Yet the ministry's own data does not back this action up. Simply put, this situation is becoming unworkable. Mr. Speaker, why does this government refuse to work with industry to streamline the process, and why won't they ensure a balance between economic, uh, environmental protection Question. and economic sustainability? Thank you. Yes, sir. Speaker, thank you once again. I, I think it's important to relay on the specific issue uh, that the member raises on behalf of the OFIA. And the OFIA understands this completely and fully, that when it comes to the species that the member is referencing, the caribou, there is a federal overlay on this particular species as well. And so whether or not is not the option. The provinces are required to come forward with a plan as directed by federal legislation. If, in fact, we do not come forward with a plan, the federal government's prescriptions and restrictions will be enforced upon each province and territory in the country of Canada. So the work that has gone on to this point is to try and position our industry as best we are able to continue to recognize the importance of forestry in the province of Ontario. We get it, Speaker. That's why we've put in place a further two-year exemption. None of what the member has just referenced Answer. in this question is going to happen. We have a panel in place that continues to work on the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, is warned. You have one wrap-up sentence. Speaker, the point is we continue to work on it. I have a legion of examples here that would continue to support and show Thank how you. we have supported this industry. That's it. New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Stuart Klein is 71 years old and lives in London West. Last week, he was vacationing with his wife in Mexico when he fell ill and experienced a serious brain bleed. He was admitted to hospital on Wednesday. By Saturday, he was stabilized and in urgent need of a transfer home to London to see a neurologist. But Stewart's family was told by their insurance company that there are no hospital beds for him in London. Today is the fifth day that Stewart has been waiting to come home while his condition deteriorates. Speaker, as we continue to hear more and more stories about the devastating effects of hospital overcrowding in Ontario, why is this Premier doing nothing to address it? Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to this particular case, but I want to, I want to just take a moment to express my uh, concern for this family. Uh, they're going through a very difficult experience, Mr. Speaker, and I want to assure the family that the Minister of Health is looking in this case. She's giving it her full attention, Mr. Speaker, because this is an extremely anxious time for a family. Uh, this is a situation that uh, no one should have to undergo, Mr. Speaker, and I know that uh, the Ministry of Health and the, the Lynn are, uh, are looking at what can be done in this situation. Um, but just to say that this is an extremely anxious time, and my thoughts, uh, like my thoughts are with the family and the Minister of Health and Long Term Care will speak to it in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Stewart's situation is critical and potentially life threatening. He also has a heart condition that requires blood thinners and a pacemaker. Stewart's daughter in law is now in Mexico trying to help him get home. When we spoke yesterday, she told me through tears that the family is desperate. They feel they are all alone, living a nightmare, and they don't want Stewart to die in Mexico. 
She said to me in an email, My dad is very weak. His heart is not doing well. He is fighting, but I don't know how much longer he can wait for a bed. We need to fly him back to Canada. Please, Peggy, I beg you, keep trying. Speaker, will the Premier ensure that Stuart is able to come home today? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the new Minister of Health, I want to ensure <coughs> that <coughs> I want to ensure that my staff and I are ready to help all members of this House when situations like this arise, uh, because of course it's extremely important to ensure the safety and access to high quality care for all Ontarians. And I want to assure the family in this case that my staff has been fully engaged in helping coordinate this individual's return home and to make the full service of Ontario's health care system completely available to this family. And I know that our health care professionals on the ground, Lynn's staff responsible for regional care coordination and staff in the ministry are always working hard to go the extra mile to ensure the highest quality of care for all Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Final supplement. Speaker, when my staff spoke to ministry staff this morning, ministry staff had said it is the insurance company's job to find a bed. Speaker, I don't think so. Last week, we heard about the Ronalds, a couple stuck in Costa Rica because there were no hospital beds in Hamilton available to help Mr. Rowland after a bad fall. We heard about Londoner Danny Marchant, who'd spent 11 days waiting for a bed to open up in London so he could get the medical care he needed after a skiing accident in Collingwood. Now it is the Klein family who is suffering because Ontario's hospitals are overcrowded. Yet all we hear in response from this government is that some temporary funding was provided to hospitals last year. Speaker, what will it take for this Premier and this government to finally take this crisis as seriously as the families Question. who are affected by it? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. I want to assure the uh, member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that there is capacity here in Ontario. It was demonstrated last week with the individual she referenced uh, who uh, fell sick in Costa Rica, and my predecessor uh, made a statement to that effect last week. <clears throat> and in particular, because of this issue, we have reminded insurers what they need to do uh, in terms of finding the appropriate capacity here in Ontario. And so what we have done is ensure that they all know that it is their responsibility to work with Ontario's system of hospitals. It's not just a matter of just calling one single hospital to find the appropriate capacity. They need to work with the Lynn. That's their responsibility. That's our expectation, and we would want to remind them of that. There are beds in Ontario for these individuals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The hospital for six children, right here in Toronto, is a world-class hospital, home to international experts and professionals that save children's lives each and every day. But for over a year now, sick kids have been struggling with overcrowding that keeps getting worse and funding that's not keeping up. In December, my leader, Andrea Horvat, toured sick kids. On that day, the neonatal intensive care unit was operating at 114 per cent occupancy. Yesterday, that same unit at sick kid is now operating at 115 per cent occupancy. The overcrowding has not been solved. It is getting worse. Why has this premier driven Ontario world-class hospital like sick kids into an Question. overcrowding crisis that's making it harder to provide the care our children need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, I think we have been, uh, we've been very clear that uh, we understand that uh, increasing investment in hospitals is important. It's why in our last budget there was $500 million in additional funding, Mr. Speaker, for hospitals in our most recent budget, another $500 million, Mr. Speaker. So we understand that there is, uh, there is a, a need to uh, increase the support to our hospitals' operating budgets, Mr. Speaker. We get that. But I think that 
the uh, the member of the third party who's suggesting that somehow that sick kids is not a world class hospital, Mr. Speaker, that somehow that somehow it has uh, it is deteriorated, is is really an outrageous statement, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Sick kids, sick kids is a world class hospital, Mr. Speaker. Literally, people come from all over the world to learn from what is done in sick kids hospital, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was recently with Bernie Sanders, who came up with practitioners from the United States, Answer. and we were talking with practitioners at sick kids. So, Order. Mr. Speaker, we understand that there is more to do, but to down, uh, to, to talk down the sick kids hospital, Mr. Speaker, is real. Thank you. The member from Essex is warned. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I can assure you that healthcare professionals at sick kids are doing their very best, but this government is not doing enough to stop the overcrowding. Every month for the past year, sick kids has been running over 100% occupancy. February was at 111%. There is red tape on the floor separating one bassinet from the other. Infection control is a challenge each and every day. And sick kids set a record this January for more emergency room patients than at any point in the last 140 years. That's a long time. This is a hospital that has run out of place. It, immediate, it needs help immediately today and capital funding to build the infrastructure they need for Question. tomorrow. Why isn't the Premier listening to sick kid and providing the fund that it so desperately needs? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Speaker. And I want to assure uh, the member opposite that we are in very close communication with our health system partners, and we want to remain attuned to their needs and determine how to best to provide ongoing support for them. As uh, the Premier has said, of course, we've made major investments. We know that uh, over the last year there has been challenges across the healthcare system uh, in uh, respect to, obviously, influenza outbreaks and so on that has added uh, to some hospitals' difficulties. In fact, for children, though I'm not particularly familiar with the situation uh, at sick kids, children have been particularly affected with influenza B this flu season as well. So, of course, we have been uh, increasing our budget substantially. Uh, we've made these commitments yes, in the 2017 budget, and we're starting to see improvements in our capacity issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. For too long, Speaker, people in this province have been asked to settle for cuts to health care and overcrowding in our hospital that keeps getting worse. No community in Ontario should be forced to settle for that. Sick kids provide critical care, cancer care, transplant that sick children cannot get anywhere else but at sick kids. This hospital should never be forced to operate at 115 per cent occupancy. Any and, and world-class expert shouldn't be leaving sick kids. Yet, in the last month, that's exactly what happened. Two leading surgeons at sick kids have announced that they are leaving Ontario. Why is this Premier refusing to stop the overcrowding and refusing to provide the crucial investment that sick kids need right now? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to remind the member of our 2017 budget, which incidentally both the PCs and NDP voted against. In that budget, we made substantial increases in health care investments in hospitals as well as community care. So, in particular, I'd like to uh, mention the $9 billion to the health care sector over the next three years to reduce wait times, provide access to care and enhance the patient experience, $500 million to support Ontario hospitals, reduce wait times and expand capacity, $222 million over the next three years to provide urgent relief for those affected by the open opioid crisis, which again, uh, in many cases, does uh, impact on our emergency rooms. And so we have so many uh, examples of our government's commitment and, sir, to, uh, of course, maintain our excellent reputation for health care provision in this province. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and, and welcome to the Royal Minister. Uh, this morning, I had the opportunity to speak with dentists across Ontario, and I learned some troubling facts. Like this government is overseeing the lowest per capita spend on public dental programs in Canada. And while the overwhelming majority of dentists participates in the Healthy Smiles Ontario program, an important program for children of low income, dentists subsidize this government's program by $50 million a year. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Schwartz is with us here today. And we heard from him this morning that he helps low income children every day of his practice but he operates at a loss because this government is underfunding the program. Speaker, this my question is to the minister. Do you not agree that this program shouldn't be delivered on the backs of dentists? Thank you. Minister for Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, or good oral health is absolutely essential for overall health, and uh, of course, our Healthy Smiles Healthy program smiles. does yeah. have an overall impact on children's health, their self-esteem, and their ability to learn. So we're extremely uh, pleased that we have our Healthy Smiles program that is uh, ensuring children have equitable access to high-quality health care, including dental care, and we have made it so much easier for children to get the dental care they need through our expanded Healthy Smiles program. And of course, we're very pleased to have a partnership with the Ontario Dental Association. And of course, we continue to work with them uh, on an ongoing basis to ensure that the program uh, meets our goals of uh, equitable dental care across the province. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the minister. Minister, uh, a partnership usually works both ways. This government for far too long has just been dictating to these dentists across the province, and it needs to stop. Speaker, there are almost 61,000 visits in hospital emergency rooms and nearly 222,000 visits to physician offices for dental problems every year. This costs the government in excess of $38 million annually, with those funds typically spent on treating the symptoms of disease rather than the disease itself. Whether it's dental care for low-income seniors or children, it's clear this government is not doing enough. My question for the minister, does this government plan on expanding dental coverage for seniors and children in their 2018 budget? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I'd like to thank all the dentists who are here today. Yeah. Uh, great partners in this program. And uh, as a partnership, uh, we continue to work together to improve dental care. Uh, as we've said, obviously, for our children. But again, we have been uh, improving dental care for adults as well. Um, we have started uh, with children and youth, uh, but we do have uh, funded programs through on the Ontario Disability Support Program, with which I'm very familiar, and also benefits through Ontario Works that can provide coverage to those in need. And so we continue to work towards building a larger program for low-income adults that will provide peace of mind for those families and individuals and allow them to continue to be productive. And so uh, yes, we will be working uh, as we speak with the Ontario Dental Association, looking forward uh, to ensuring that our partnership continues. Thank you. Question the member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Let me be clear, Speaker. It is time for national universal Pharmacare. You see it, please. You see it, please. We're still in warnings. Please put your question. But yesterday, the federal government chose to study this idea yet again, without promising any action, without promising any money, and without any timeline. That leaves millions of Ontarians between the age of 25 and 65 without. Stop the clock. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is warned. And there's a couple other on my radar. Finish, please. 
that leaves millions of Ontarians between the age of 25 and 65 without prescription drug coverage, that leaves people sitting at their kitchen table cutting their pills in two to make the prescription last longer. The NDP has a plan to deliver, deliver universal Question. pharma care for all Ontarians, no matter how old you are. Why doesn't the Premier? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, the uh, the party, the third party, has a plan to deliver a little bit of medication to people, Mr. Speaker. That's not universal pharmacare, no. Mr. Speaker. Our colleague, our former colleague, uh, Eric Hoskins, has taken a role with the federal government not to study pharmacare, but, Mr. Speaker, to determine how to implement. Pharmacare. Yeah. as passionate about this here in, at Queen's Park as he is now working with the federal government. He was the architect, Mr. Speaker, of the major step forward that we have made in Ontario, OHIP+. Plus. And I can tell you, he would not have gone to do this role if he did not believe that we were on a path to a national pharmacare plan, Mr. Speaker. You say that, please? Thank you. Using your tie to hide your mouth doesn't cut it. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, a drug plan that cuts people off from drug coverage the day they turn 25 years old is not good enough. Ontario should not have to settle for a plan that leaves people between the age of 25 and 65 with no prescription drug coverage. That's not pharmacare, because real universal pharmacare is prescription coverage for everyone. New, Demo yeah. New Democrats believe in universal pharmacare, and we have a plan to deliver it to Ontarians and make sure that no one is left behind. While the federal government continues to study pharmacare yet again, instead of acting upon it, why doesn't this Premier have a plan for universal pharmacare right here, right now in Ontario? Okay. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. we're the only government that has moved forward and actually has put in place a pharmacare plan, Mr. Speaker. And let me, let me, if I may, indulge me for a moment to make a comparison. Mr. Speaker, we moved ahead on retirement security yes. in this province, Mr. Yes. Speaker. There's a national enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan. We moved ahead on OHIP Plus and a universal pharmacare plan for children, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Now we've got a federal government that is going to implement a national pharmacare plan. No, Mr. Speaker, I kind of think Ontario is leading the way. You see that, please? You see that, please? Start the clock. New question, the member from Barrie. The Minister of Education. In 2007, a male high school student in Nova Scotia was bullied for wearing pink to school. In order to show care and solidarity, the other students showed up to school the following day in a sea of pink shirts in support of their classmates. We know that putting an end to bullying cannot be done by any one person alone. We are stronger together. And it is together that we stand united against bullying by everyone. It is the responsibility, it is the responsibility of all of us to help prevent bullying in our schools, our communities, and our workplaces. Minister, please tell us what our, has our government done to promote student well-being so that everyone in our schools can question. feel respected, accepted, and protected from bullying. Good question. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, bullying is a terrible thing. It can take a child who is happy and confident and leave them feeling depressed, sad, and anxious. That's why today, on February 28th, I stand together with thousands of students and educators across Ontario to recognize Pink Shirt Day. Today, Students and educators are wearing pink and are rallying together to say no, no to bullying and no to harassment. 
Mr. Speaker, I want you to know our government is committed to fighting against bullying in schools, communities and workplaces in Ontario. In fact, our government introduced the Accepting Schools Act to support safe, inclusive and accepting schools. It's the first legislation of its kind to become law in Canada, again leading the way. And our equity plan is a further commitment to bullying Answer. and building an inclusive education system. Mr. Speaker, supporting a culture of acceptance in our school communities is vital to helping our kids Thank thrive you. and be successful. Thank you, thank you, Minister. As an educator and the MPP for the Riding of Barrie, I know that our government is committed to putting supports in place so that every student can reach their full potential. I know that this government believes in supporting student achievement and well-being with safe, inclusive, and accepting learning environments for all students. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you share what students and educators are doing to recognize Pink Shirt Day? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, Pink Shirt Day is an important reminder that we all have a role to play in creating a positive school environment. It's about equity, fairness, and respect. And I want to thank our educators, students, and parents for their tireless efforts every day to create safe and accepting schools. In fact, Mr. Speaker, every year the Premier's Awards for Accepting Schools recognizes teams across the province for their exceptional work to create safe and inclusive environments. In addition, we now recognize cyberbullying in our Accepting Schools Act, so important. And we're teaching students about online risks and giving them tips to develop online safety. We're also, uh, we're also providing bullying prevention training for teachers and administrators. Mr. Speaker, we know that more work needs to be done, Answer. but we're committed, committed to ensuring that all students feel safe and accepted in our schools. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Corth Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety. Last fall, I hosted a press conference to bring attention to the contraband tobacco problem in this province. I highlighted the fact that there has been a 37 per cent increase in contraband tobacco use since 2014 and that contraband tobacco products are more accessible than ever. These products are unregulated and harmful, and they help to fund organized crime rings that threaten the safety of Ontarians. But instead of protecting Ontarians from harm, this government has sat on their hands watching our province become the top producer of contraband tobacco in the country. So my question to the minister is, why has the government allowed contraband tobacco to thrive at the expense of Ontarian safety? Minister, the Minister of Finance and Correctional Services. You do identify you first. I apologize. Thank you. Minister of, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. This is a very important issue. We have been trying to battle the contraband tobacco, ensuring that the underground economy and their criminal activity gets curbed. In the 2017 budget, which you voted against, included a number of measures in regards to this. One was to, uh, to go after the items acquired from or used during offenses under the Tobacco Act, which now must be forfeited. We restricted the, import the uh, importation and possession of cigarette filter components, going after the wholesale activity, uh, and, and which is called the acetote tobe, to register the, those manufacturers to identify what's being delivered, and we further enhance the oversight of raw leaf tobacco, including strengthening compliance and enforcement provisions. We've acted on, we've actually engaged with greater enforcement activity. We are working alongside the Indigenous communities as well to ensure that they benefit from the very product that's being produced and being exported for their benefit. So we're looking at economic development opportunities, legitimize some of that activity. Also recognize that the federal government do take their cut and the province of Ontario does not. So we're looking at trying to correct the matter. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Obviously, you're not doing enough, and so I'll give you an example, a successful example out there that their government should be following. It's from Quebec. So in 2009, Quebec launched its Access to Back program, which gave new powers to law enforcement officers and provided them with the resources they needed to fight contraband tobacco. Since then, 
They've had a 50 per cent reduction in contraband tobacco sales in Quebec, and millions of new tax dollars have been generated. So, Mr. Speaker, the government needs to actually do something to target criminal networks and stop the smuggling and distribution of contraband tobacco. So my question to the minister, why won't this government give our police officers the resources they need to actually enforce the law and stop the spread of contraband tobacco? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we actually have increased uh, supports for the police activity and around uh, contraband tobacco, as well as those off reserve where criminal activity have been occurring and, in fact, have been catering to young people, which are trying to curb and correct. We're also, as I said, looking very closely with Indigenous communities, looking at, at the, the abilities for self regulation, and it's been working. Because of the work of our, our, our Minister of Indigenous Affairs, we have actually had much better dialogue and efforts to try to curb the activity and work alongside the members of our communities for the benefit of safeguarding our students and our children, at the same time ensuring that we legitimize the activities for the benefit of our economy as well. And Smoke Free Ontario has done a tremendous job, more importantly, of curbing the activity of tobacco overall in this province. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Our public libraries provide extraordinary value to their communities, whether it's employment skills upgrading or the integration of new Ontarians, whether it's providing free space for seniors groups or the early development of literacy skills. Our public libraries create community across the province. But in 1998, the Harris government cut funding by 40 per cent to libraries. The government's public library operating grants maintained the conservative cuts, paying for less than 2.5 per cent of libraries' annual operating budget. So the Liberals maintained the conservative cuts. The Ontario Library Association and the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries have lobbied the government for years. 20 years for funding to be restored. Why doesn't this Premier recognize the importance of libraries as a vital public service by lifting the funding freeze? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker, and I'm delighted to rise as the new Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. And to, uh, to address this issue, uh, Speaker, shortly after being sworn in, one of the first groups with whom I met were uh, libraries. And uh, I have met with a number of local librarians as well who have expressed concerns to us about funding. I want to say that our government does value the contributions of public libraries in building strong, vibrant communities right across Ontario. And we recognize the wide range of people in our province who make use of over 1,110 library service points right across the province. Now, Speaker, through our culture strategy, we recognize that public libraries um, they are very essential spaces for access to culture, services, technology, to uh, our community life. And the strategy that we have commits to reviewing and updating provincial funding Answer. programs in order to build the capacity of public libraries. We're working with them. We know that they want increased funding, and we are addressing that. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, funding libraries is the best way to acknowledge how important funding libraries are in the province of Ontario. Now, both the City of Kitchener and the City of Waterloo have passed council resolutions asking the provincial government to restore adequate, appropriate funding for local libraries that would increase each year in line with the Consumer Price Index. This is a reasonable request after 20 years. Mary Chevreau, the Kitchener Public Library's chief executive, called libraries the cheapest deal in town. Every $1 invested in libraries equals $6 in terms of economic benefit for the community. Without a funding increase, though, Chevreau says, we're going to have to cut somewhere, and the most obvious place would be the actual content that we carry in libraries. Speaker, it's time for the Premier to step up and lift the library funding freeze so that everyone in our community can learn, can connect, and innovate, and yes, belong. Will the Premier commit to lifting this 20-year public Question. freeze on library funding in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much. And Speaker, I wholeheartedly agree that funding is important for the sector. By way of background, Speaker, the funding was frozen in the late 1990s by the, uh, the Conservative Party and uh, quite disconcerting to the library sector at the time. But I will. The member from Kitchener Conestoga is warned. Carry on. 
So, to continue, Speaker, uh, the funding was frozen back in the late 1990s. The government values a contribution of public libraries. They do build strong communities. They uh, build out literacy. Our libraries support lifelong learning. They provide resources to students and newcomers, and they help small businesses and entrepreneurs. And that's why funding for the Internet Connectivity Program was increased just last year. This increase is in recognition of the role that yes, libraries sir. play in providing digital services and building out our community. And so we are working with the sector. We are aware that they are looking for increased funding, and Thank I you. am looking forward to having an answer for them soon. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. In the fall, I asked the Minister a question on forward enrichment, a building in my riding occupied by over 140 artists, cultural producers, galleries, festivals, and shops. At that time, we encouraged the city to create a new property tax for arts and culture organizations in Toronto. That's because Ontario's vibrant arts and culture organizations are part of what makes this province such a great place to live. Absolutely. The city has since passed a motion requesting the province to create a new property tax class for creative co-location facilities. I understand the next step will be for the province to create a regulation to allow this change. Mr. Speaker, through to the minister, can he please tell the House uh, give the House an update on where this regulation stands? Thank you. Minister Fias. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the member from Trinidad Spadina for his ongoing advocacy on this very issue. I am proud to talk about this resolution for the people of Toronto and his riding. MPP Dong has worked tirelessly with the owners and tenants of 401 Richmond for the last year, and I thank the member for his leadership in his community. <coughs> Cultural and innovation hubs contribute tremendous value to our communities and the economy, which is why I'm pleased that the City of Toronto has passed the motion for creative class property tax bracket. Mm -hmm. My staff and Ministry of Finance are working closely with the city staff to finalize the details of the provincial regulations, which will be completed in the coming weeks, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure we get it right, and I'm proud to work alongside our colleagues in this House and my caucus members who work so hard to support local arts and community culture, and in particular, proud of this member who has achieved a great step Answer. forward for the cultural organizations of Toronto. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, the tenants of former Richmond received good news in the fall when the property re uh, assessment was reduced by MPAC. And the news of the City Council's resolution uh, is indeed to be welcomed. It will address their concerns on their future financial certainty regarding property tax. For that, I am thankful. I've been asked by other stakeholders in my writing who would also like to be included in this new property tax class on um, eligibility. Could the minister explain how our constituents can determine if they are uh, eligible? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I want to thank the member again for this important question. We're making sure the city has the maximum flexibility so that this new property class can best reflect the needs of Toronto. Let's be clear, it's the city that's responsible for establishing the criteria surrounding the new property class. And I understand city staff are in process of developing a framework in consultations with the arts and cultural community to ensure that eligibility criteria reflects the goals of that community. So any questions that property owners might have should be, in this case, referred to the City of Toronto. However, we will continue to support the city and other parties in their efforts to ensure that properties like 401 Richmond can continue to operate as important incubators for the arts and cultural community. Again, I thank the member for this important here, here. question. Thank you. question the member from Niagara West Glanbrook. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, on November 30, 2016, my very first question on my very first day here in the Legislature was to the former Minister of Health uh, and Long-Term Care when I asked the Minister about redeveloping the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital in Grimsby. This hospital was built in 1948, and although the staff there provide excellent care, the, faculty, the facility is now outdated and in desperate need of redevelopment. At that time, the former minister said he looked forward to working with me going into the future on the Hamilton Health Sciences proposal for infrastructure. Well, Speaker, the future is now, and we haven't really seen a lot of progress. My question is very simple. Are my constituents going to be let down once again? Oh. 
Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly look forward to working with the member opposite. Uh, I uh, would like to say that I have not been briefed on the particular circumstances that he references in relation to uh, the facility, uh, the institution in his riding. Uh, I look forward to finding out more, uh, and I certainly commit to the member that I will look into it. Uh, I. Uh, uh, would uh, say in general that I am certainly aware that there is a need for redevelopment across the province. I've certainly seen institutions uh, in my own riding that uh, uh, are worthy of consideration. Of course, that's going to be done in a completely objective way, and priorities will be established. I uh, look forward to working uh, with with the member on this file. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, I would be more than happy to sit down and brief her on this particular situation because my constituents have been fighting for the redevelopment of the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital uh, for far too long, going so far as to raise $14 million towards this redevelopment. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that in 2004, this Liberal government called the project a priority. First, the government promised construction would start by 2009, then they promised it would start uh, in 2011, and then the next promise was that redevelopment would begin in 2013. Then, after years of broken promises, the 2012 budget cancelled the project completely. So, will this Minister of Health and Long Term Care commit to the redevelopment of West Lincoln Memorial Hospital and give the residents of Niagara West Glanbrook the health care they deserve and expect? Question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we certainly have committed to some $9 billion to expand and rebuild hospitals, uh, not only, of course, providing that uh, essential infrastructure, but also creating jobs. Currently, some 34 major hospital projects are underway or being planned. Uh, obviously, we will look at the particular situation that you reference, but uh, I'm informed, actually, that the Harris government designated that particular institution for closure, and we, in fact, have reprieved it. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a gentle, subtle reminder that some members are already on warnings. Gentle, subtle. New question. The member from Was it? No, no, I think there was an arm wrestle going on. The member from Niagara Falls. <laughs> Can I do my question now, Mr. Speaker? I, Thank you. Uh, I, I set him up, you knock him down. Go ahead. Mr. Speaker, we've been fighting this legislature for four years to ensure the 40 racetrack has a future. When the private for profit Woodbine Group, which the Premier has effectively put in charge of public horse racing funds, announced its unfair stabling policy last April, re raised this issue in the House and demanded action. But instead of fixing it, the government announced a surprise audit of Fort Erie. And that was fine. The track accepted this audit and opened every door. It has met every demand this government has made of it. Can the Premier tell us what the result of that audit was? And what she, what she had done to address the issue we raised last April. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we all know and we appreciate the advocacy of this member as well that Fort Erie is an important uh, economic viability and heritage to that community as well as to the province. The track is critical to the local community and to the historic significance it's had over the years. As mentioned, we are working on a over $100 million horse racing industry program that will benefit Fort Erie. In fact, as he knows, Fort Erie has benefited by $7.9 million for the racetrack, even though they lost quite a bit under some, con some conservative cuts in the past. But let me be clear. The, the, the racing industry, and Fort Erie specifically, gets supports for the purses as well as for operating, and I'll say more than supplementary in regards to the audit. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. It is my understanding that the Fort Erie racetrack passed the audit with flying colours. In fact, Fort Erie may be the most lean and efficient track in Ontario. Every year, they continue to break betting and attendance records. 
but by giving the private for profit Woodbine Group such an extraordinary influence over horse racing in Ontario and allowing it to use its influence against its competition, this government has put Fort Erie at an unfair disadvantage. When the Premier stopped Woodbine from using its government granted power over horse racing to put competitive racetracks like Fort Erie out of business. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, member opposite also knows that we did resolve a state wing policy. Woodbine has also come forward recognizing the importance of that relationship with Fort Erie, and that's how I can proceed. In terms of the audit, we do we have received it. It, uh, it has not been brought to my attention, but I do know that it has uh, been noted that it's been efficient. There are some challenges that they face, and the mayor has sent me a letter in regards to some of the measures that he would like us to see to proceed, and we are acting upon it. We are actually going to support these small tracks. We're going to provide the necessary steps and have oversight. I want Fort Erie and the small tracks to be part of the Ontario Racing Board, to have transparency and overall uh, effort to see what the industry should be doing. It cannot be just on one uh, industry or actually one provider. It has to include everybody as well as the horsemen so that they can breed and have greater stability in the yes, breeding sir. of horses. And that too is an issue for Fort Erie. I recognize that. I thank you for your effort. We will work together to benefit Fort Erie thank as well. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston in the audience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The recent flooding events in areas of southern Ontario have clearly presented a very difficult situation for many residents, and our thoughts are with them. And this falls almost one year after the floods in many parts of my riding of Kingston and the Islands, including Wolf and Howe Island, as well as neighbouring Amherst Island. I know the Premier was on the ground in Brantford last week to meet the, with first responders and municipal leaders as an ice jam in the Grand River forced a state of emergency and evacuation. I'm also aware that on Monday, Minister Morrow visited communities impacted by the flooding last week, including Brantford, Thamesville and Chatham, to see the situation firsthand and the damage caused by these floods. Would the minister please elaborate on the current flooding situation across some parts of the province and the impact that it has had Question. on people's lives? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you, and thank you to uh, the member from Kingston and the Islands for the question. Speaker, unfortunately, once again, we've seen a very significant flooding event, this time in southwestern Ontario. As the member mentioned in her question, the Premier was on the ground in Brantford on Thursday. I toured uh, Brantford and Thamesville and Chatham myself on Monday. The damage is indeed significant, Speaker. It is quite something to see. I want to first, in the first instance, offer uh, my thanks and appreciation to the volunteers, to the first responders, and to the elected officials. It, it was really something. Speaker, it was really something to, to see and witness uh, the people who come through. There's nothing that brings the community together uh, like having to band together to fight a natural disaster, and they have done a great job. No one was injured. There were no fatalities in this specific instance, Speaker. The waters have receded to the point I was excited to be able to announce just yesterday, I believe, and late sir. Monday, that we were able to announce the activation of our program, the Disaster Relief for Ontarians, Assistance for Ontarians in Ontario for the City of Brantford, uh, just yesterday morning. Thank you. Come back here. Thank you to the Minister for the answer. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing an increased number of natural disasters occurring in Ontario. Mm. Our government has adapted our disaster relief program to ensure people can receive the financial help that they need when a sudden, unexpected natural disaster occurs. I understand applicants within a particular area for which the program has been activated can apply to be reimbursed for basic necessary costs related to the disaster and the damage caused by overland flooding can be eligible for assistance under the DRAO program. I would also like to acknowledge our DRAO teams right across this province for the on-the-ground on responsive work and advice that they have given in these very difficult circumstances. Minister, could you please elaborate on how the DRAO Question. works and how the province has seen a large increase in the number of severe weather events related Thank to you. since 2010? Minister. Well, speaker, once again, thanks to the member from Kingston and the Islands for uh, the question. Unfortunately, Speaker, we are seeing more of these events. They are happening more frequently. 
and when they occur, they are more severe in their nature, almost always. And unfortunately, Speaker, I can't help but mention, as it seems we have four people vying for the leadership of the official opposition who seem to have no interest in the issues that are driving the occurrence and severity of these floods. It's very unfortunate. By way of example, Speaker, between 2005 and 2010, our programs delivered about $8 million in provincial assistance right across the entire province. Since then, the entire uh, level of assistance required, including the 2013 ice storm, has raised to include a total now of $180 million in disaster assistance that's been just needed in the succeeding seven years. Speaker, we obviously need to be better prepared to deal with these issues. It's incumbent on all of us at the provincial and federal level to do more. We have accommodated as best we're able two major changes in the program. No local fundraising required anymore. No local administration required anymore. The point being to be as responsive Answer. as we can to fund essentials so that people can get back into their own homes after one of these natural disasters has Thank you. occurred. New question, the member from Leeds Grenville. Speaker, my question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, in uh, November, I alerted the Attorney General of a serious issue of police officer safety and excessive cost related to the frequent transfer of prisoners at the Brockville Courthouse. The solution is to finally equip the court to do remands by video. The Attorney General assured me that he understood this was a serious matter and that he would look into it. My question did prompt some action, but not in Brockville, which remains one of the only courthouses in eastern Ontario without video technology. Instead, the Attorney General recently announced $7 million to upgrade existing video equipment at the Ottawa Courthouse in his backyard. Oh. Speaker, can the Attorney General tell the Brockville Police Chief, Scott Frazier, why the safety of his officers isn't a priority for this government? Good question. Attorney General. Well, Speaker, uh, uh, I thank the member for the question, and, and, and I want to assure uh, the Chief in Brockville and, and all the Chiefs and Police Officers and Correctional Officers across the province that their safety and security is a utmost priority. Uh, for this government. We continue to take steps and measures to ensure uh, that officers are safe, that our justice system is efficient, and the accused individuals to their uh, uh, counsel have appropriate opportunities uh, to be uh, able to present at the, at, at the courthouse. And Speaker, that is why the member opposite is right. We are continuing to make investments across the province, including in, in Ottawa, uh, where we are deploying technology. In many instances, the deployment of technology is very much dependent on uh, the nature of the institution we're looking at and what kind of technology is available, whether we can use Lisa a video remand or not. Sir. In case of Ottawa, we were able to deploy that technology sooner, uh, and I'm very proud that uh, we're investing in Ottawa to make sure that our defense councils can have access to uh, their clients via video Thank remand. You. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, I I'm not against improving security at the Ottawa Courthouse. Staff and public safety in every Ontario court facility should be a priority. I just wish this government would set up its spending priorities on need, not on which side of the House the local MPP sits. This is another example of Liberal government playing postal code politics. A courthouse in a Liberal riding gets newer and better, while police in Brockville are forced to continue doing over 800, 800 physical prisoner transfers every year. And that's a terrible waste of police resources. As I told the Attorney General three months ago, Chief Frazier says the situation puts officer safety at risk. Speaker, will the minister put politics aside and commit to making this long overdue investment in Brockville? I think, uh, Speaker, it's really disappoint, disappointing to hear the member opposite yeah. politicizing the safety and security of our first responders. Lisa Speaker, won't be happy. By, by casting uh, and making a question so political in nature, not recognizing the fact that the Ottawa Courthouse may exist in my riding of Ottawa Centre, Speaker, but it, it serves a much broader city, a city of almost a million uh, people with many, many ridings yeah. from represented by different political Lisa. parties, uh, Speaker, but a broader region as well. As we also know, Morning. the Ottawa Carlton Detention Centre is a much larger correctional in institution which uh, hosts uh, uh, inmates from uh, Eastern Ontario, Speaker, uh, who 
uh, receive services at the Ottawa courthouse. So I think, Speaker, it's extremely unfair and unfortunate. The member opposite yes, knows that decisions are not made based on postal courts, are not made based on which writing is government writing or not a government writing. It's made on, it's made on needs uh, and, uh, and, and the services that are available. Today, I, uh, the time for question period is over. Today, I'd like to recognize some guests in the gallery. The third person I don't know, and I want security to check them out, but we'll find out later. The, uh, we, we have a former member, Alvin Curling from Scarborough North. I, uh, I tend to want to let people know who they are, so he, he was the member from Scarborough North in the 33rd, 34th, 35th, 36th, Scarborough Rouge River from the 37th, 38th, and Speaker from the 2003 to 2005. Also with Mr. Curling is a guest of his, who is the Honourable Wentworth Charles, the key advisor to the Government of Jamaica. Welcome. <laughs> and as I said, and as I and as I said, security will be looking into the third person. <laughs> There are, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.